Thank you very much. So welcome folks, thank you for joining us for this, uh, this webinar today. Uh, let's just um, get things moving here. So uh, this is me, I'm uh, Director of Developer Relations at, at Sneak, and I'm joined by, uh, by my co-host, uh, Scott McCarty, who's a Principal Product Manager at Red Hat. So what we're gonna be talking about today is how we can go from an application level uh, vulnerability um, into a much more uh, widespread exploit. And um, if we look at the recent history of large scale um, exploits and data breaches, uh, very, very many of them have followed this pattern that a, a, a single um, application with a, a vulnerability in it um, gets exploited. And then that combined with infrastructure misconfiguration allows an attacker to uh, grow the the blast radius of that of that particular um, that particular exploit and so what we're going to look at today is a demonstration of how um, a, a potential attack route um, through a kubernetes cluster um, from a, a starting point of a of a vulnerable web application so our our thought uh, our thought process for, for today's demo is that um, our, our starting point is that we found a vulnerable web application on the internet. And this is clearly a, a mock-up of a remote command execution vulnerability. Um, remote command execution vulnerabilities are a uh, unfortunately fairly common um, class of vulnerabilities uh, in um, web applications. Um, we've seen recent ones in, in application servers like Tomcat. And Basically, the way many of these vulnerabilities work is they allow an attacker to um, basically um, run uh, commands remotely on the, the server that the web application is running on using things like malformed URLs or specially crafted um, requests. For the purposes of this demo, um, this is mocked up here, and our, our vulnerable application will, will allow us to, uh, to run um, uh, to run arbitrary commands using um, uh, 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 particular um, formed URL, which we'll see in, in a minute. So um, we we'll start here from, from, from setting out what we know. So what we really know is that we've, we've connected to this application, which we know has this vulnerability in it. We're connected on port 80, it's exposed on the internet. So we don't know very much about the, uh, the, um, the context of how this application is deployed at the minute. And let's also introduce our timeline of doom. And the timeline of doom is how we're gonna track how our exploit scope has changed over time. So as we can see, we've got our starting point here, which is our application vulnerability, which is gonna allow us um, to um, exploit this remote uh, command execution um, vulnerability and, and run commands on the server. So what can we do from here? Well, um, many applications these days, as, as we all know, are running containers and, and typically um, containers are configured with environment variables. So the environment variable that this application is running tell us some, some interesting things. So if we uh, run our specially crafted URL here and we're gonna run this command equals end, which is uh, the environment variables that our particular application. And um, this has told us um, quite a lot of interesting information. So we can see uh, we're running in a Kubernetes cluster. There are lots of um, environment variables here that are related to Kubernetes. So we know we're in an uh, internal address of the, of the, um, the uh, Kubernetes API server. Um, we can also um, uh, assume here that uh, the pod running our application is exposing uh, a port via a Kubernetes service. We're seeing service port references here. And so when we go back to our, our diagram, we can now start to fill in some, some information here. So we're going to assume we've got a pod and we've got a service because that's how we um, expose uh, things within our Kubernetes cluster. 
and and we can we know that there is an internal IP of the of the Kubernetes um, API server. So let's also see uh, maybe what we can find out about the uh, network at this point. So we'll recraft our um, our uh, command vulnerability, and we can see um, some interesting things about the uh, the uh, the network here. We can see the uh, the IP address of our pod, and we can see the range that that's operating in, and that's going to be useful information that we're going to come back to later. So for now, we're going to make a note of that IP, that 10.244.1.9, and we'll we'll come back to that later on. So when we update our diagram again. We've added now that we've got the IP address of our of our pod. So let's see what else we can do. Um, by default, um, every pod in a Kubernetes cluster has a service token auto mounted in it, and this service token is associated with the service account that was used to create the pod. Um, you can control this on the uh, service account or the pod level uh, by setting um, auto mount service token account token equals true or false. But let's have a look whether that token um, exists in our in our context here. So we're going to run this this or kind of cat whether we expect the token to be, and it seems that our permissions that we have whatever the permissions are that our web application is running at are letting us access that service token. So um, let's um, update our timeline of doom here. And so straight away, we've got some credentials. So we've got this pod token is available inside the pod and the, um, uh, the permissions of our, our application are letting us access that token. Um, so it, it's probably worth noting at, at, at this stage that everything we've done um, so far, you could also have achieved if our um, if our uh, potential vulnerability was um, was just a directory traversal vulnerability, which let us escape the the um, the uh, directory which our application was running in because um, we can also uh, find a lot of these um, the the uh, the environment variables by catting um, this file in uh, in proc. Right. Let's uh, so let's uh, take a look at what we can actually do with the token, um, and uh, we obviously we know where the internal uh, um, address i server because we can see it in the uh, in the environment variables there uh, so what we're going to try and do is um use the token and query the api server internally in the um in the kubernetes cluster and so we're going to try and this has succeeded we're going to put together a, a curl command that's going to use that um, service token and because the token exists we can make some assumptions that we also have um the certificate that the Um, see if we can uh, query the endpoint of the endpoints uh, API of the um, Kubernetes server, and this has returned us again is to build a bigger picture of um, what the, the the cluster actually looks like. Um, this cluster is actually running uh, locally on my laptop, but in a in a real cluster in lots of, of, of scenarios, this will actually give you um, down here in these endpoints will give you the external IP address of the Kubernetes API server. Um, I know because we're running this in kind locally where exactly where this uh, where this um, the external address of the API server is running. It won't be this IP address, it'll be just ex exposed on local host on the same port. But this is a vulnerability and it's been created by a two permissive um, policy uh, for the service token. So the service token has been allowed to query that endpoint API and so we can see here we've used the the uh, gone from the pod uh, to query the internal IP of the API server, and we can add in this permissions um, uh, issue here where we've been allowed to access the endpoints API. Um, so now we've got a token, 
Um, and we've got um, the external uh, address of the API. So we can actually configure our local kubectl to use that token against the um, external endpoint of the API server. So if I go back and, and just grab that, uh, that token again, um, let me just shift this over a little bit so we've got a little bit more room here. So um, I've actually got a little helper script here just to set up my, uh, my kube config. Um, but uh, obviously you could do this manually. Uh, one, four, three. Uh, just to make sure that we've got that uh, that kube config set. So the first command that I'm going to try and run here is just to do a kubectl get pods. I'm in the default namespace because I haven't specified a namespace. And we can see I've actually been unable uh, to list anything in the default namespace. And it's saying here that we don't have permissions uh, to list um, the, the pods resource in the default namespace. But we have actually learned something um, from uh, the output here, what we've what we've learned is that the service account here is namespaced and it's namespaced into this um, secure uh, um, uh, namespace. So perhaps what we'll try and do now is to use that token to look at pods in uh, the secure namespace. And we can see straight away that we've got some permissions here. We've been able to see a single pod that's running in this secure namespace. And clearly this pod is most likely to be the actual application um, that, we've, uh, that, we're, um, that we've just been looking at. Let's just move this away. Okay, I'll save that for now. Um, so uh, let's investigate a bit more what permissions we do have. And there's a, there's a variety of ways in Kubernetes that we can, we can do that. Um, we can use, we can do the kubectl auth command and I can run kubectl auth can I minus minus list minus minus token equals uh, the token that we just looked at. And this is going to give us um, uh, for the default namespace. And you can see here that we can't actually do very much here. Um, but if we run that command again, and we namespace that to the secure namespace, what's interesting here is that on this star resources, we have a whole bunch of permissions that we can uh, operate on almost any resource within that namespace. And we can um, look at this in a slightly different way. I have, um, let's just bring this back to the top again. Um, I actually have a kubectl plugin here called Access Matrix. And um, I can run the Access Matrix um, command. Uh, and this gives us a, a, a bit more of a readable um, uh, uh, view on uh, what permissions we have. Again, this is in the default namespace. So um, we're not seeing any permissions there really. Um, but if we run it against the uh, secure namespace, we can see that on a lot of different objects within the secure namespace, um, we actually have uh, we actually have permissions. Uh, one second, Let's just bring this over here. Just bear with me one second. Let me get rid of that. Control. There we go. Okay, sorry about that. Uh, okay, where were we? Um, right, so let's go back to our our diagrams again and uh, and see what we have found out here. So um, we now know some extra stuff. We've connected to the external IP of the Kubernetes server, and we now know that we've got some namespaces. We've got this secure namespace where the application that we were connecting to originally is running. And we also have a default namespace. We've got no idea what's running in the default namespace, but we know it exists. And um, there are, what we have discovered is that within the secure namespace, um, the role has been allowed to have um, too many permissions. So we've got a lot of things that we've been able, that we can do within that namespace 
um, uh, in terms of interacting with objects within that namespace. This is a fairly common pattern where people um, uh, kind of get, get um, the idea that namespaces are actually a security boundary and therefore it's okay for a service token to say, um, well, within this namespace, I'm allowed to do whatever I want, but I'm not allowed to do anything in any other namespaces. And, you know, as we'll see as we go through this demonstration, that's not really a, a strong security position to take because namespaces are not in themselves um, a security boundary and it's very easy to um, escape namespaces um, in various ways. So adding to our timeline of doom, we now know that we've got this role which gives the service account um, too many permissions um, in that particular namespace. So let's go back to our, our shell again, and let's just clear this uh, down a little bit and make it a bit easier to see. So uh, we know in our secure namespace that we've got this pod running. So let's try and get a shell on this pod. So if we do kubectl exec uh, minus it our pod name minus minus uh, bin bash, uh, we need uh, and secure in there. Okay, so now we've managed to get a shell on our um, compromised pod. So let's take a look to start with who we are in terms of users within this pod. So um, we've run, who am I there? We're running as this web admin user, presumably that is a uh, restricted um, permissions user just um, being used to run the particular web application. So perhaps we can see whether we can um, elevate our privileges by running sudo um, within, this, uh, within this pod. And so, you know, we don't even have the sudo command um, available to us within the pod. So, you know, that probably Probably when the person set the, the, this uh, this um, particular pod up, you know, it was a restricted user, can't run as root. Um, it's it won't can't be uh, you can't run sudo. So you know that lots of people might consider that that's a fairly um, good security position to take when we're doing application deployment. So let's just try one other thing here. I'm going to try and create a file, and that has actually succeeded. We can see that file there. And this is actually another um, vulnerability uh, here. Um, if we can create files within pods, it potentially means that as an attacker, I can download new software. I might be able to change um, configuration. Um, I know by the uh, the um, my ability to use curl to access the um, internal um, API endpoint that I have curl available. So that definitely means that I can start downloading things into this pod and, and potentially make changes. So now if we if we go back to our slides again, you know, this is our next um, uh, uh, misconfiguration here, this read write file system, um, which allows an attacker to modify the container. And we would protect against this by uh, configuring the security context of our um, container and setting this read-only root file system equals true, um, which will then prevent an attacker from being able to download um, things into our container. So let's uh, just come out of our container again for a minute and let's try doing, uh, doing some um, other things here. So, um, we know we have permissions in this secure namespace. So uh, perhaps we're going to try and um, spawn a root pod. Um, so I have some, uh, some YAML files here. Uh, let's just have a look what we've got here. Uh, let's see what our root pod.yaml uh, will try and do. So this is going to try and uh, spawn a, um, an Alpine um, image Alpine by default will will start as the root user. So let's uh, apply that little bit of YAML. Uh, root pod. Uh, 
what happens. So it looks like something's happened here. We're saying that pod root pod has been created, but let's actually um, see what's going on in the namespace. And so we've now got an error here, this create container config error on our root pod. Um, and if we use kubectl describe here, we can get a bit more information on what's actually happened there. Um, and so the interesting bit here is this error here. So um, container has run as non root and image will run as root. So something has prevented us um, from spawning a, uh, a root container. And this is likely a pod security policy, but at this point, we don't actually know that, but we know there's some control here that has stopped us from being able to spawn um, a root container. So let's try something else. Um, let's try maybe running a, uh, a privileged pod, but we'll run it as non-root. And again, let's have a, a look at our YAMLs and see what we're actually going to do. So non-root uh, privileged. So this is going to try um, to uh, create, uh, to spawn a uh, container image that I prepared earlier. It's, it's not running as root, it's running as a, as, a, as a normal user. But what I have done is set the privileged it true flag. And I'm going to try and mount um, as of, uh, the host volume, the host um, uh, root um, uh, directory into my uh, container, which I would be able to do if I was running um, privilege, because privilege basically gives me all the permissions. So let's just try and um, uh, create ISF YAMLs uh, non root. YAML and in the secure namespace. And we've again been stopped from running this. And this has given us some more information that we didn't have a, 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 in the pure root case, that this is actually hitting a pod security policy here. Um, it's saying that privileged containers are specifically not allowed within our pod security policy. So if we now go back to our uh, our slides for a second, we can add some more information that we've discovered um, through that little uh, exercise there. So we now know we've got a pod security policy that's running in that secure namespace. And that's what stopped us um, from, uh, from uh, being able to spawn both root and, um, and uh, privileged containers. So does that stop us from extending our exploit? Well, Let's try let's try something else. So um, again, we'll look at our at some YAML that we've got here. Uh, we're going to do non-root, uh, non-privileged. So I'm going to drop all the uh, the root and privilege stuff. I'm just going to try and spawn my um, custom container image that I that I uh, have in a in a registry um, on the internet. So let's see what happens if we try and run this one. Seth, uh, demo YAMLs, uh, non root, non privileged, and we want to run that in the secure namespace. Well, it looks uh, certainly a lot more promising here. Uh, we'll get pods in the secure namespace. Um, and we can actually see that this pod has succeeded. So um, this is kind of another um, misconfiguration vulnerability here as well, in the sense that this cluster has not restricted me from spawning containers using images from an external repository. So that's basically allowed me to pull any random container image that I could have with whatever tools I want in there from a, a registry um, wherever, and it's allowed me to, to spawn it. And this image isn't running as root, and it's not running privileged. But I know that um, this, this particular container image um, has a, a remote shell running in it. So now I can do uh, kubectl pop forward um, to that particular uh, pod. And I know that this is running on 8080 because I've built the container. So I'm going to port forward um, to port 8080. And um, now I should be able to. Uh, just open a web browser to 8080. And now I've got a shell again on my newly created pod 
um, that uh, that I now have access to to all these tools. And clearly, I could have um, used kubectl to to uh, to um, exec into that container. But I just wanted to illustrate here how easy it is for you to then get access via different mechanisms into a random container that I happen to have spawned as an attacker. So um, again, we weren't running as root when we when we created this. So we can see uh, who we are here with this sneaky user. It's not a it's not a root user. Um, but what I can do here, even though I didn't run as privilege, I didn't run as root. I can run sudo su and I can achieve um, a root like shell. This is not going to be a full root privileged shell um, because of the context that the container was spawned in, but it's still going to give me additional permissions that I did not have as that sneaky user. And the problem that's been that, that's happened here is that the pod security policy um, didn't include allow privilege escalation equals false. And we'll look in a minute why this is important, but we can. Um, Look at, at, at our, our next vulnerability here is that um, we didn't have this allow privilege escalation false set. And um, what that means is that even though I wasn't running a root, I could escalate my own privileges. And in this case, I used the sudo command, but you can also do these things with uh, specially crafted binaries. Um, and um, Lots of people to kind of make the mistake here that the, by saying, well, I'm not going to allow privilege, I'm not going to allow privileged containers and you've got to run non root that you don't actually need to set the allow privilege escalation equals false. But that's really not true because, um, and we'll see why in a, in a second, because if I, um, as my normal user within this container, um, let's just have a quick look at the network here. So um, I, I know now what the what the IP address of this particular pod is. And what I'm going to try and do now is from my pod is explore the network, because what I really want to do is to to find out what other things are running now in this Kubernetes cluster, maybe new um, attack vectors, new um, insecure applications that I can continue to extend my exploit in. And if I run um, uh, the nmap command, um, let's just have a look, as, as a normal user here, uh, 10.244.1.18 slash 24. So I'm going to try to um, scan uh, the, um, the uh, network segment that, that my particular pod is in. If I try and run nmap as a non-privileged user, the kernel stops me from doing that because I do not have the capability, the Linux kernel permission level to be able to um, to access some of the low level networking features in the stack to be able to do scans. But because I'm able to sudo here, I can just copy that command. And now I'm able to um, scan that that uh, the network segment that my pod is running in. And as I noted earlier, we know that our original vulnerable pod was at this address 10.244.1.19. It was exposing a port 5000 service. And what we've now discovered is that we have another application at 10.244.1.10, which is also exposed on port 5000. Now, this might be very interesting to us. You know, there's the possibility here that not only do we have one um, vulnerable uh, web application running within this particular cluster, but perhaps this is another um, instance of the same application. So let's update our, uh, our update our picture. So we've added our, our pod security policy didn't disallow us from privilege escalation. So we were able to escalate privileges. And um, we have discovered another application on port 5000. That's in at the minute. All we know is that it exists. And then thing that we've been able to um, poke around in the networks. We didn't have any network controls in place that stopped us from going from one pod and scanning the network. And um, we'll, we'll go and use that, uh, that particular uh, vulnerability again now, because we want to discover more about the, um, the uh, new application that we've just discovered. So um, again, my, uh, my sneaky pod has another tool in it called SOCAT, which enables me to create tunnels between um, particular I I um, instances. 
So what I'm going to do is create a tunnel from my pod to this new pod that we've um, that we've just discovered. So I'm going to run SoCat. I'm going to say uh, we're going to listen on port 5001, and uh, we're going to um, the other end of that is going to be this 10.244.1.10, um, and that's going to be on port 5000. And we'll just background that process. And so um, back on our local console now. So we're going to stop uh, port forwarding on that 8080 port, which was giving us access to the remote um, the remote console there. But I'm now going to port forward to that new 5001 port, which is the other end of the tunnel connecting to our mystery um, pod. So now we've connected to, uh, to that. And uh, let's just uh, have a look uh, what's actually on that um, on that particular uh, endpoint. So we're connecting to 5001 on localhost, and here we go. We've got another instance of that vulnerable web application. So it looks exactly the same. It's probably got all the same vulnerabilities that we know about. So let's try and uh, and see whether we can get a new token here. Um, and so by uh, passing again um, uh, our uh, uh, formed HTTP request, we've managed to expose that uh, a, a different token. So let's open and see what we can do with it. So let's just make some more space here. So um, first of all, uh, let's uh, just modify our kube config to use this new token. So that was the original token we got. Let's just comment that one out. And uh, let's um, put in this new token. So uh, let's just add this. So again, you know, I normally start uh, whenever I'm poking around in clusters by just let's uh, see whether we can see anything in the default namespace. So kubectl will get pods in the default namespace, which if you remember the first time around, we had no permissions in the default namespace. So this new token has given us permissions in the default namespace. So if we again look at um, use the kubectl auth command, uh, can I list minus minus token equals our new token? So we can see here that we've got a substantial um, set of permissions across uh, lots and lots of resources within the default namespace. So with this token, what we've managed to do is to escape that secure namespace and uh, have permissions in the default namespace. So if we go back again to our slides, um, again, we were able to escape the network controls. We were able to create that tunnel into this uh, into this um, other pod that was running in the default namespace that we didn't have access to before. And so, what we've there's our tunnel from five thousand and one to five thousand, and we now know that that particular pod is running in the default namespace. So let's try something else with our new token. So we. what we can do with our new token. So uh, create minus F uh, demo YAMLs. Uh, we won't try and run as root, but what we'll try and do is create a, a privilege pod. Uh, and what we can see here is that that's now worked. So the, this namespace is not restricted by the pod security policy that we discovered before. Um, with a privileged pod, we can do a whole lot more because we've not just launched a pod that's privileged. But if you remember from the uh, our previous look at that YAML, YAML file, uh, non-root uh, privileged, what we've got set in here is a host path mount, which is going to mount the um, root directory of the uh, node. And these are extremely dangerous, and we'll see exactly exactly why in a second. So if we now uh, get a shell onto this new pod that we've just created. Zec minus IT, non-root priv, uh, and we're going to execute uh, bin bash. 
So um, we've now, uh, at this point, we are the sneaky user, but we know we can escalate privileges to root. Um, and if we look at the process table as this root user, this is the root user in the container. And we can see the privilege, the process table here is pretty small. And we're only seeing the things that were actually launched within the context of the particular container. But in our YAML file, we mounted the, the, uh, the um, host slash directory into this mount path of, of slash to root. And so what we can do here is change root into that um, directory where the host file system is mounted. And here we've now got the, the nodes process table. So we can see here, we've got instances of container D, we've got all sorts of different processes running here. Um, in a real cluster, we might have uh, other, other containers. Um, we've got the kubelet, we've got everything that's, that's running on the host, we can now see. And so uh, when we go back to our um, diagram here, we've now added this privilege pod, which has been able to mount things from the host. So, what, now we have the host file system mounted in our container. We actually have access to the token the kubelet is using. And the kubelet token has much more permissions than those service account tokens that we've been using up until this point. So if within our, um, within our uh, pod, we now do export uh, kubeconfig equals et cetera, uh, kubernetes kubelet.conf, which will give us the kubelet token in our kubeconfig, and we now run kubectl from here. And we're going to look at uh, what pods are in the kube system namespace. So the kube system namespace is where all of the um, control plane for the uh, Kubernetes cluster itself runs. So we can see lots of information about which pods are running the control plane. And um, we could dive deep into where those particular pods are. We could start attacking those pods. Um, but for the purpose of, of our um, demo today. Um, the other thing that I'm interested in is what the names of the nodes are. And so I can find the names of the nodes, and that's going to give me the ability to now define which node I'm going to deploy a particular um, pod onto. And that's going to be important for extending the next piece of our exploit. So um, just to add um, to our diagram here, so we've got no permissions uh, restrictions in the default namespace. So the pod security policies were only applied to the, uh, the smaller namespaces. And we now know a lot more stuff. Um, we know some stuff about the kube system namespace. One the, the pod that we're particularly interested in in this instance is our etcd pods. In this case, it's a single pod, but um, we're going to, uh, the next phase, we're going to, to, to try connecting to that. At this point, when we've got the kubelet token, we probably have pretty much control of the cluster, but we are going to take this a little stage further um, just to show you some other ways that we can potentially do stuff. So the first thing I'm going to actually try and do is uh, start a pod using my kubelet token. Uh, so I'm going to just run BusyBox and see what happens. Um, so straight away, we can see that this has failed because the kubelet token actually isn't allowed to start pods like that. Um, we can't use that to start pods directly on our nodes. What's, what's interesting is that um, we get this output that, the, uh, that we can create what are called mirror pods. And this, um, this is uh, interesting once we have um, the kind of ownership of the node here, because what you can do in a Kubernetes cluster is to put YAML files directly into ET, uh, Etsy Kubernetes manifests on the node themselves, and those manifest files will get automatically um, uh, automatically run by the cluster. And so that would give us many, many other attack vectors against the other control plane pods that are running in the Kube system namespace. But because we've sort of escaped the pod security policy, we know what nodes we've got, we can actually kind of attack on a different um, vector here. And um, what I'm going to do, uh, we're going to launch a pod to the node that's hosting the etcd, um, uh, the etcd cluster. And we're going to, again, use a specially crafted um, YAML file here. Uh, uh, let's just come out of this pod, actually. Uh, exit out of that again. Right, so um, what we're going to do 
is we're going to run uh, an etcd client pod and we obviously know that we can mount the the the, uh, the host file system we've been able to do that right now and so we know where all the configuration for etcd lives so uh, what we're going to do is is to mount the etcd uh, configuration and then we're going to set a whole bunch of environment variables for our etcd client because we know where these things are going to live on the host file system so um let's just apply this one and create minus f and uh, yaml's etcd client just want to see whether that's running so we've now got our etcd client uh, pod running so let's actually see whether we can use the etcd uh, client in that pod um, to connect to the etcd cluster so we're just going to run etcd kettle member list and we're getting responses back from the etcd cluster so we know that this pod is actually connecting to etcd and that gives us some some more things to update in our diagram so uh, we've launched a pod which has the host file system mounted it's connected to the etcd um the etcd cluster and now etcd contains a lot of interesting information about the cluster about the whole kubernetes cluster not least of which is um, secrets. So let's see uh, what secrets this etcd uh, cluster actually knows about. And we can see we've got a whole bunch of secrets here uh, that uh, we could use for, for lots of different things. Um, what, the one we're particularly interested in here is this cluster role aggregation controller secret. So um, let's see if we can get the token for, for that particular secret. Uh, and I'm just copy and paste this one because it's a bit long. And we need that little things on the end, SX2VV. And we have actually got another token. So if we uh, grab this token, let's just clear this up a bit so we can have a bit more room. And we run kubectl auth can I minus minus list minus minus token equals our new token and what we can see here is that if i just move this over a bit that what this token gives us is the ability to modify roles in the cluster so that's effectively cluster admin rights because i can change um, roles give people whatever permissions that i particularly uh, that i want to give so at this point um it is kind of game over um it probably was when we had the Kubelet token, to be honest, but this just shows another mechanism by which you can um, access the, that information. So let's just update our picture again. So we've got we've got a token that gives this cluster admin rights. Um, and um, I, I, at this point, before I pass over to, to Scott, I should really say that, um, that there's a lot of thank and props needs to go to all the super awesome folks in the Kubernetes security community. Um, many of this stuff is based on, on various great presentations that they've gone, done in the past, but particularly uh, Mark Manning, Ian Coldwater, and Duffy Cooley. So at this point, I will pass over uh, to Scott. Right. Thank you. That was awesome, Matt. Um, I love watching you escalate and then find, I love that you had scenarios where, where like you failed and then got around them. It showed like how realistic, like it is to basically attack one of these and, and escalate. So then we have to ask ourselves, okay, so you found some dead ends and then you found some ways, but you know, to get through or around those dead ends, but then how could we have prevented this? Right? Like, yeah. I, so, so I'm going to dig into that a little bit and next slide, if you don't mind. So I think I, I like to go back to basics because I'm old and I, uh, I always think of these things from like 20 years ago that I learned and I think about how can we apply them in, you know, in the context of Kubernetes and containers. So these are the three basic things we've used these forever, CIA, uh, confidentiality, integrity, availability. Um, and, and I ask like, so, so if you think about what Matt did, basically, he, oh, sorry, one second. Oh, no uh, worries. I lost the slides. Wait a second. That wasn't what I wanted to do. That's all right. I can talk through it as you're, as you're, as you're. Yeah, still, you uh, carry on. So I'll get them. Uh... 
So, so confidentiality, availability, integrity, right? If you look at what Matt did, he owned the cluster, right? So once he owns the cluster, he has full ability to compromise confidentiality, availability, and integrity. He can literally get into databases and any app in the cluster that he wants to. He can steal passwords. He can do anything. I mean, once you have cluster admin, you have everything. Um, and so, so you look at confidentiality, definitely could get access to data. Availability, he could take the cluster down if he wants. Uh, integrity, he could hide something nasty in there like a Trojan and just not let anyone know that he got into the cluster. So essentially all three of those, all three of those attack vectors have been compromised with what he showed. Um, so now, now let's go to the next slide, if you don't mind, Matt. Are we seeing the slides again there, Scott, just to make sure? Yeah, we are. Yeah. Okay, cool. No worries. Right, so we're on this one, right? No, no, one more back. Sorry. Yeah, so... So now we ask ourselves, okay, well, what are the primitives we have in this new world of containers, right? Like, so I try to break it down even a little bit further than just the Kubernetes cluster. We think about, all right, well, container images is definitely one sort of new primitive, if you will. This is a thing that we have to think about. The container host is another thing that we have to think about. The registry server, which honestly has its own role-based access controls and all kinds of nasty things that a, a, a user could do or, or you know, to hack things. And then the container orchestration itself. Now, what we went through today was mostly the container orchestration, but we did actually, you know, if you look at the first, the, the, the initial attack vector that he used was based on a container image. And so that could be, you know, that could be the app, that could be libraries, it could be whatever. In this case, we showed an app that was already hacked, but but you have to think through the entire stack of software there because that's special, I think. So the next slide, please, Matt. Um, so one thing I didn't comment, I, I meant to comment on the last slide though, was that you know these are the new things you need to think about in a containerized environment, but you still have all the old things to worry about too because you know there's things outside of the Kubernetes environment like layer seven firewalls and and you may have like front doors and networking and you know IP uh, you know address spaces and things like that, but in the context of containers, I want to say these are the four things. So, so now, the, like I mentioned, though, the container image is special, right? Like that's actually how we got in the front door of this whole Kubernetes cluster was with, the, with the, that. And so if you look, there's sort of three layers. I try to break it down to about three different layers of content that's in there. Um, you know, there's the app. That's what the developer writes themselves. And this could be some code that is copy and pasted from Git. Hub. This could be, you know, forked code from GitHub. This could be code you write yourself and you just made a mistake and you didn't mean to do something um, that, that allowed a hacker to get in. Um, there's also below that though, there's things like the JVM, you know, the Java virtual machine, the Python interpreter, the, you know, the Ruby interpreter, Node.js, blah, 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 et cetera, et cetera. So there's, you're inheriting some code from just the, the interpreter or even the language that you chose. And then below that, you know, what a lot of people forget is, is that like the JVM is still written in C and it's compiled against glibc uh, in most Linux distros. And so is Node.js and Python and Ruby, et cetera, et cetera, PHP, et cetera. So Sort of you got to think about that entire stack in the container image and say, okay, well, where's somebody going to get in, right? Is it, some, is it some exploit to the glibc? Is it some exploit to the JVM? Is it some exploit in the app code I wrote? Obviously, the most likely is in the app code, and it probably gets less likely as you go down in, in. But it's also much, much worse the lower you go in the stack if there is an exploit of some kind. Um, and then I mentioned the host, right? You have to think about the host and, and the Kubernetes cluster itself, which is actually what mostly the rest of the, the escalations that, that Matt did were around those mostly. So now next slide, please. So one of the things, can we, can we prevent this, right? So like one of the ways that we would think about preventing the attack surface um, for getting in that app is again, the critical execution path. So, so in this case, we showed a web app that basically was able to just execute commands, but, but in, a, in a real world scenario, you'd probably have some very complex set of ways that they either hacked in, you know, either an SQL injection or a, you know, URL attack that exploited something in some text processing library that maybe relied on something in glibc. But anyway, no matter what the attack vector was in the critical execution path, it probably involved some C library, some language runtime, and then some code you wrote. And then how do you minimize the permutations of that critical execution code? So in this example, I'm showing on the left, if you just go out and choose any container image, you're going to like, and I showed a random selection of popular container images here. Let's say there's three different versions, Fedora 34, 33, 32, Ubuntu 16.04, 18.04, Ubuntu 20.04, 20 
you know, Alpine 3.12, 3.11, and 3.9, and then say Red Hat Universal Base Image 7 and 8. If you just let developers go pick everything they want, I just kind of added up the permutations of stuff that you would have. And it's you've got eight different versions, three versions of muscle skin, 11 different versions of OpenSSL. This is kind of more attack surface than if you just selected like a single base image and then standardize on one glibc and one open SSL. And this would be, these are libraries that I specifically picked that are in the critical execution path of almost everything we use today. Like every web server, you know, uh, Nginx open, you know, Nginx or Apache are going to use open SSL and glibc. So these are, these are not like, you know, hypothetical ones. These are ones that, um, that quite honestly, we at Red Hat pay a lot of attention to because they're so critical in the execution path. But if you can minimize that set of dependencies in that critical execution path, you can actually really reduce your attack vector and lower the likelihood that somebody would get in that front door through the app. So the next, the next um, slide, please. Um, so uh, now going, I, you know, I, I started with a container image because I think that's how we got in the front door here. And also I think that's the first thing a developer touches, but also, you know, Matt's Kubernetes cluster was actually configured decently well in certain ways, but clearly it only takes one to get in, right? Like they did prevent the run as root user, which is actually good and also prevented starting a privileged container. Um, but obviously the escalation of privilege kind of got us in a default, for example, open shift environment, which, which, you know, we do prevent those kinds of things with like our policies out yeah. of the box. So, so, but, but I mean, obviously we have to have something for an example. And so he had to have a way to get in, but, um, but, but that matters, right? That entire stack. And then when you go to change those defaults, you want to be very careful about why you change those defaults, because a common thing that I see people do is they go to run a container image off Docker hub, which Matt showed you know, if you pull a remote container image, the first thing a developer says is, wow, why won't this run as root? You know, they're annoyed. They're like, disable this run, allow root run, you know, run as any user uh, in the cluster. And that is a really bad mistake to make. Um, and a lot of people do it. It's not uncommon to be annoyed by security controls and then just disable them without fully understanding what the implications are and how you're letting someone have essentially an attack path like that. And so, I, yeah, in that scenario, I say start with a stack that is already configured default by secure, you're secure by default and limits those things and then don't turn them off. That was, you know, this is like the disabling SE Linux, um, you know, in the old world, um, which actually mm -hmm. still exists in the Kubernetes world. But, um, and, and honestly, nobody shuts it off because you don't even notice it. But, uh, but they do disable the, the security context a lot of the times, which is kind of the new, the new version of that. So next slide, I think that was really all I... But I wanted to at least kind of like hammer home, you know, be careful with the code you download. Obviously, that's probably the big O from a computer science perspective of like how somebody's going to get in your cluster. Um, start with the best trusted base image. Start with a trusted Kubernetes platform. Don't disable the things. Then verify everything, right? So I think like Sneak and Red Hat are a good partnership because, you know, once you've kind of downloaded that code and you're being careful, then you scan it to double check scan the Kubernetes YAML, scan the, you know, the container images and verify everything. But you have to sort of trust, but verify because you can't, you can't scan your way out of bad quality, right? Like you can catch it and maybe remediate it, but it, it might already be too late. So, so always try to start from a good place and then, and then verify it is kind of what I want to hammer home. Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, I think that's, you know, when you look at that, at that pathway that we showed today, while, the, while there's bits of that, that were obviously mocked up for the purposes of, of this, um, webinar you know you you really could have prevented that at the start by not deploying that that remote command execution vulnerability and i mean we see those in the wild all the time right so it's not that this is a a completely unrealistic scenario that doesn't happen i mean you know that that was the that was the point in but i i think uh, the 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 other key bit really is that the the configuration is becoming as important as the application vulnerability and you really for uh, uh, you know in your, in your cloud native security posture you've really got to be thinking of all these things in, in in equal terms because if you if you get one of them wrong then you've really opened yourself up to to a much uh, a much more um a much wider blast radius than than just simply having a vulnerable application. Yeah, I would concur on config. The more I think about it, config actually perhaps is actually maybe like five x as dangerous as even the code a lot of the time. So we've got a few questions here. I know we've only got five minutes left, I think, but we'll try to get through uh, through some of them. Um, so Pavlo says, what are the best practices for Helm charts to configure RBAC properly? Um, should I follow the least privilege principle? Um, 
I, I think we're probably slightly too much scope here to talk about exactly how to configure our back in Helm charts, but um, I would absolutely concur with you that least privilege principle is what you should always be following in these yeah. circumstances. And uh, that applies to, to, you know, lots of the things that we've looked at today as well. It applies to things like setting capabilities in security context. It applies to, you know, if you start from least privilege, um, you're always going to be in a better position. Um, uh, I'm not a Carthikian. I hope I've pronounced that correctly. How does an attacker identify that the web application is hosted on a Kubernetes container? So perhaps you missed the very start of that um, that uh, hack. Um, but we we in this in this context, uh, we looked at the environment variables. the The application was exposing the environment variables that told us what the context was that that container was being executed in, because we had access to um, to a remote command execution vulnerability. But I actually showed that even with a directory traversal vulnerability, which is a in some ways, I guess, uh, uh, would be seen as being a less critical vulnerability because it only allows you to go to uh, get information rather than directly run attacks. But you could have found all of that information through a, a, a directory traversal as well. Um, Rahul asks, to use the service account token, do we need cluster machine access or can we access from any machine over the internet? Um, if you know the, as I showed there, if you've got the AP, external IP, uh, IP address of the API server, then potentially you can access that from any machine over the internet. Uh, Sergio says, are the vulnerable application endpoints uh, on purpose or is that something uh, Kubernetes is exposing by default? Um, do you mean the... AP, I'm going to assume you mean the API endpoints. So exposing the API endpoints is an enormously common configuration. I think out of the box, actually, um, vanilla Kubernetes will expose those. Um, I mean, you know, you look at all the uh, problems people have with crypto miners um, on Kubernetes clusters. This is exactly because the endpoints are exposed and, and available uh, on the Internet. So um, hopefully that answered that one. And the last one was, can a network policy prevent that tunnel connection created from the pod in the secure namespace to one in default? Absolutely. And that was the point that I was trying to make. Um, I, I think uh, whilst, you know, the, it kind of um, things like network policies or um, the other thing that, that would have prevented it would be, uh, you know, if you'd been using um, a, a proper service mesh setup where you're only allowing a pod to talk to the thing it actually needs to talk to and nothing else. Um, but again, it comes down to that principle of least privilege, um, you know, and, and I think uh, we're really only just become, beginning to scratch that one, particularly around uh, uh, network connectivity between pods, I think is, you know, service meshes are complex, right, Scott? And and I think, you know, yeah, yeah, they're also easy for people to get wrong, right? So, you know, but in theory, that's one of the things that, that service meshes are supposed to kind of give you is that defined pathway between applications. Okay, folks, I, I uh, oh, we've got some more coming. I don't think we're going to be able to get to the rest of these, I'm afraid. I think we're actually out of time. Uh, so um, if you, if any folks on here want to contact me on LinkedIn, send me questions, I'm on LinkedIn, I'm on Twitter, feel free. Yeah, same here. Yeah, especially I, I noticed the one around attack surface. I'd be happy to discuss that more afterwards if you find me. Father Linux on Twitter is easiest, probably. Okay, wonderful. Thank you so much to Matt and Scott for their time today. And thank you for everyone w for joining us. Um, I hope that you will join us for future Linux Foundation webinars. And just a quick reminder that this recording will be up on the Linux Foundation's YouTube page later today. Okay, thank you so much. Have a wonderful day.